the 135th meeting of Boston VR on November 2020. Our featured speaker was Mina Johnson, a longtime educational researcher. She talked about her educational game, Catch a Mimic, and some of the very interesting research that she and her team conducted using that game. Uh, the event was held on the virtual campus of iLearn Network. They are a consortium of academics and academic organizations dedicated to multi-user online virtual environments for learning for education. And their campus is open 24-7, and they'll be having their big event in May, June in 2021. Be sure not to miss it. That evening's schedule, we had an hour of learning and mixing, hour of talk, and an hour of more exploration of the iLearn campus. We would like to thank Terra for their ongoing sponsorship, making events like this possible. If you are a student and you want to get the training to get a full-time XR job, please look them up. If you're an organization looking to hire fresh young graduates who know how to make XR, also please take a look at XR Terra. The following Monday, November 23rd, we are going to have our meeting on equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, Boston VR strives to be an egalitarian group, but we are part of an unequal culture and we want to remove the barriers to participation based on race, gender, age, ability, economic status, you name it. And doing that requires active, intentional work. So please come join us uh, November 23rd at 9 p.m. That will be a Zoom session. On December 17th, we will be um, hosting XBoost, a startup focused on a gamified VR environment, and a physical exoskeleton. Um, we'd also like to plug MedVR. They are hosting a medical VR hackathon, hopefully in June 2021. And in the meantime, they are producing a great deal of excellent online talks on uh, medical uses in XR. So as ever, Boston VR needs your support with um, organizing, mailing events, publicity, donations. Uh, if you're a young person looking to create resume items for yourself, uh, we can be your venue. Now, the recording that you will see is a recording, or most of it, uh, taken in a Zoom session, which paralleled uh, Jeff's, my, Verbella view, view of uh, into Verbella using the desktop app. Hi, Chris. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. What a snazzy sweater. <laughs> ah, I've right. been saving up for it all year. Is this Lori's all voice right. that I'm hearing? I hope they have Christmas sweaters to choose from, really tacky Christmas sweaters. Um, that's uh, actually, actually, Mina saying, Johnson. Uh, so Chris is actually going to be doing a, a, a Christmas party with oh, his class. She sounds on like the, Lauren. On the campus. Kind of. Um, oh. Shortly. Um, uh -huh. So uh. in December, we'll actually turn on the exactly. the, the Christmas theme. So the, the campus will be, all, will, will be all decorated. There'll be a Christmas tree and we'll snow. And then you'll also be able to put on Christmas attire. And results from a study we just finished uh, in the fall. And then talk about some future work that we're doing at Arizona State University. What does embodiment in VR mean? It means that you're using the body as the control. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all the research that it's body-based metaphors for learning, but uh, we know, and also uh, my lab has worked a lot on how we can sh uh, show that using gesture and the body helps you retain information. Embodiment, there are three constructs that uh, we think will measure the, the amount of embodiment in a lesson that's been and one would be uh, of the three axes, one would be congruence. So does the gesture congruent to what's being learned? In this catch a mimic game, I'll show you, uh, there's the action of the hand swinging forward with the controller to capture a butterfly. 
And although that's uh, well mapped to the what you're learning about, it's a little bit repetitive. So I wouldn't say this is like the best game in the world for that, maybe medium high. Another construct is immersion and presence. So when the technology is more immersive, we're assuming that presence is also increased. So that's why I push those two together, which a lot of people don't like, right? A lot of people say immersion is only a property of the technology while presence is a subjective variable. And that's probably true, but I think for most people in America, we just inflate those two. Given the high fidelity now of immersive uh, platforms as well. And then magnitude of the gesture probably plays a role. More research needs to be done on this. But one question is, is the spinning of an arm more embodied than twirling of a finger? So if you have more sensory motor engagement going on, can we assume that it's more embodied? So I we've designed some design guidelines to for people who are creating content in VR. These focus on STEM education, just because that's my bias. What can I say? and using interactive hand controls. So all 18 guidelines are presented in the Frontiers article that you can get here. Um, and I can give you these slides later if you want those links. But I also decided to just kind of pare them down and make it easier for folk. And it's called the necessary nine. So I have like nine design guidelines that I also think are helpful. So let me show you a quick video of the Catch and Mimic game before I go through some of the results of the study that we did. This, this game is available in four languages now, and it's on WebGL, so you can play it in a 2D platform, but also available at uh, WebXR, so you can just download it directly into any headset, although I only play test it on two. And um, it's also in the Oculus Store on Rift and the Go. So I guess that's my cue. Um, whoever's gonna set up the Yeah, this one, catch a minute. Nope, the slide on the left screen. I thought maybe you can see it. There we go, that video. So if people just want to zoom to the left screen, you can see this is what it looks like in the low resolution Go headset. So you're immediately transported to this rainforest. And then you're using this single hand controller to capture a butterfly. And you need to deduce which ones are poisonous and which ones are not. And give you lots of feedback, certainly immediate feedback. When you hit a butterfly, you're going to either get a skull and a crossbone in red to show that's an incorrect poisonous one, or you'll get like a, a, a green or with a positive hit. That will let you know you got the right We also embedded some uh, audit assessment in there. So as you're in the headset, you're moving up these bars to talk about the um, predicted probability of a butterfly survival. So now you sort of get a sense of what the action is, right? You're swinging your hand to capture the butterfly. And I'm going to go back to the middle screen now. And so again, there's six levels of play in here. There's there's bad butterflies that are poisonous and they don't change throughout the game. And there are good ones that uh, via Batesian mimicry change over time in many generations to become, to mimic the bad ones, right? So you can see that, I don't know if you can see my cursor actually moving around, but the, the good one starts out with lots of yellow. And then by the end of level three, there's more orange in there. This is something that's been verified, studied by Walter Bates in the 1880s. So one of the things we did was to um, add some assessment within the game, right? So the population dynamics are difficult. And this one question that we asked students actually took many weeks to iterate on. I think those of you who do research understand how long it takes to get things right. Uh, and we forced them to be reflected within the game. So the question is, move the handles on the bars to show your best guess. What are the chances of survival for each butterfly species? And so this blue oval in the middle is active and you can grab it and move it up and down. When you're ready to submit your answer, you hit submit and then you get immediate feedback. If you put the levels in the wrong place three times in a row, we're going to animate for you the correct answer because we don't ever want students to leave with incorrect mental models. Although at the end of the day, that might not have been the best idea. The gesture is a hand movement upwards. And of course, in most cultures, that means more. So that's kind of uh, congruent and mapped. And we had those that inserted at two times at the end of level two and the end of level. Three. So here are the results. You're all sitting on the edge of your virtual seats waiting. for this. We compared a 2D PC platform to 3D immersive VR. 
you use the Oculus Go. Uh, it was a two by two by three randomized control trial. So the first uh, factor was embodiment with two levels, low or high. The second factor was platform uh, with low being the 2D PC version or high, the 3D VR version. And we had three time points, test, immediate post, and a one week follow up. The DBs I'll talk about today are content knowledge gains and efficacy of the embedded assessment. So here's what it looks like in a two by two table, right? Immersivity, low or high, and then active embodiment. In the low condition, you're watching a playback of someone else who's caught the butterflies. So it's basically a video within the headset or on the laptop screen. When you're in the high active embodiment condition, you're actively using the mouse to catch the butterflies or you're using the hand controller, the go hand controller, and you're swinging it around in space to catch the butterflies. So in low embodied, all users could advance the text cards with the controller and all could fill the interactive bar chart with either the mouse or a swipe. In the high embodied, again, the difference was that you could do those two things above, but you could also have agency and control over the swinging of the butterfly net. Here are the results. We had 217 participants from a Psych 101 subject pool. Very few of them had been in a VR uh, HND before, so that was novel to them. They were randomly assigned a condition. All groups were matched at pretest. Overall, of course, one would hope, the participants made significant gains in learning on an experimenter designed content knowledge test that we created that ranged from zero to 30. So that's nice to see, right? We have a T of 14, like everyone's learning about natural selection. So that's, we wanna see that. But really what, what we're more curious about are the differential gains. So here's a progression on this knowledge. The bolded factors significant, right? So prior knowledge significantly predicts post knowledge. That's not amazing. Uh, level of embodiment significantly predicted the, at a P of 0.01. And then platform not predictive of learning, right? And I found that odd because we were thinking that in the VR condition, they'd learn more. But then if you dig deeper and you run an embodied by platform interaction, you see that that is significant, right? At a, value of 0.015. But there's something going on within the four groups. And here's how we split them up. Green line is high embodied VR. So just focus on that. The green line has a nice slope. And then the black line is the low embodied VR. So what happens is when you're in the low embodied VR condition and you're not able to swing the net and capture the butterflies, it really affects your learning significantly so, you learn significantly less in that condition. Whereas when you're on the 2D PC, it doesn't matter if you're watching the video or if you're using the mouse to capture the butterflies, you're almost learning equivalently. So that was a, a new thing that people haven't presented before for platform differences. We did some uh, wise comparisons and the low embodied C did better than the low VR showing here on the right is that OVR condition did significantly worse than all three of the other conditions. So the question is, why were there no main effects for platform, right? We would, we would assume that, you know, VR would always do better than 2D PC, or at least I would, because I'm a fan of VR. But we didn't see that. There was no platform effect. And this is why it's important to look at interactions. And then I'll also say that at the one-week follow-up, the uh, low-embodied VR group was still significantly lower than the high embodied VR, but it dropped a titch and the other ones came up a titch. And so that was no longer significant. So a week later, the three top groups are kind of similar and the low embodied VR is still suffering in its retention. So I like to say platform is not destiny, it depends on how you design the content and adding more embodiment is going to be better. There are some other variables that we assessed. Uh, like I said, the in-process variable where we gather number of tries on the bar chart. Tries could range from one to three. Remember, we built it after three times, so it couldn't go more. We also gathered a self-reported Likert scale uh, information on the, what the presence they felt, the engagement, and the agency. Those, so this was after they went through the game. They filled out that survey. And then I'll just talk about a path analysis real quick. A full one would look like this with everything connected. And then what we found with the significant links you just keep in the links that are uh, p-value of 0.06 or below. Beside the links are the standardized beta weights, and uh, the significance is represented by the number of asterisks. And 
I kind of sped up by like pre-play, like, you know, you, you come into the room and before you even do anything, you're, spl you're split into form embodiment level and you come with some prior knowledge. And then level B, during play, there's something going on, feeling agency, or you're doing these bar charts, which we call the in-process variable. So remember, you're, you're using the bar chart to build up and make predictions about survivability. Then at post-play, you're reporting how much presence you felt and your level of engagement. All of those variables feed into this thing called post-test knowledge, and then that feeds into retention. So I kind of, on the left, I split it up by time, then, and what you can see here is that there are indirect and direct acts for post-test. But what I find kind of interesting, um, the orange lines, what's going on with the what's going on with the in-process play, right? So like those are negative links. So the embodiment, you have the lower your in-process score is, and that makes sense. If it was easy, I would toss it out to the audience as a question, but I'm just gonna say that makes sense, right? Because if it takes you three times to get it right, then that's a higher score and you're probably in a lower embodiment level, right? In negative four. And that in-process has a direct significant effect on post-test. So if you're doing poorly in the in-process measure, you're going to do, uh, so, if, so if you have a low score on the in-process measure, that means you're going to have a high score on the post-test because you're getting it right. And that makes sense as well. And uh, that tells us that it's, it's kind of a valid measure that, that we've created because it is predictive of post-test and also retention. That's good to see. So take home message, VR educational designers should be cool about inserting non-interactive content like passively viewed videos into immersive VR. It's not uh, taken as well as one takes it when you're learning on a PC because we're used to watching videos, you know, passively watching videos on our 2D PCs, but not in immersive 3D VR. Better to make the content interactive and embodied possible and to increase agency because this positively affects content learning. So. I'm gonna stop there and I think I won't take questions. I think I'll just go into talking about some of the new stuff we're doing at ASU and then take questions afterwards. Uh, all right, so this is a website we just launched like a month or two ago. Uh, it's, called, it's at xr.asu.edu. I would love for you guys to check it out and give me feedback on it. One of the first games we launched was called the COVID Campus Simulation. And you know, my lab worked really hard all summer building this. It gave us great purpose, kept us from being depressed. And then we launched it and like uh, 150 students went through it and I gathered some data on how they went through it and that was nice. And now it feels like old and dated. So I don't know, I should probably up, probably re-up and put new information in there, but it was all about like masking and things like that, which seemed super unknowable and there's a virtual campus, there's a scavenger hunt. All of this is mainly student design content, so we're very proud. With the Learning Futures Collaboratory and Meteor Studios, we're also building something called the Career Arcade. So this is an experience where you can go into a VR or WebGL 2D experience and see what it's like to be in different careers, right? Like something you would do if you were a planetary scientist. What's something you would do if you were in uh, the construction sciences? Uh, master's program. And so in the construction room, which we're actively building right now, we have something called the Craniac game. And there we have hand controls. And also you get in there and you can swing around these crates and you're trying to put them in the right place. And that's really fun and engaging. In the background here, you see the BIM house. So it's an it's a interactive building model house where, you, where students can click on and see what's going on with the wiring, what's going on with the studs, the four levels of buildings and they will try to fix something that's wrong. So if the plumbing's wrong and, and the wires are getting wet, they need to go in there and sort of weld the plumb, the, they need to weld the pipes back together again and stop that plumbing problem. Very short though, very short, easy games, just to get them excited about the career. It's not like I'm teaching them like specific content, it's just to get them excited. We have a build a bridge game. So the first thing is where are you gonna place the bridge? And there's four areas you could place the bridge in. This would be, a bad area because we have all these overhangs here. So it's going to fall down. The truck is going to fall in the water. Of course, everyone likes to see water. And then the one I've been spending a lot of time on is called the tuned mass damper game. So 
So there are certain variables you can control as the user in this game to learn about tune mass dampers and how they keep buildings safe. Uh, one of the variables is length of the cable. So here's a still image showing you that. But I think now let's go ahead and jump to the um, to the right screen and we can look at the tune mass damper. Maybe it's back the screen. I'm not sure. Um, um, yeah, and we can look at this uh, video that we made of EMD. I got excited about this because I was in Taiwan, Taipei 101. If anyone's ever been to that building, it's pretty neat. And they have a suspended mass damper. We made it look different so we didn't sue us. So here are the three variables that you can control. The mass of the damage, the length of the cable, like is it at the 70th floor or 80th floor? And then K, which is the thickness of the piston at the bottom. And there's actually a fascinating video out that shows this damper ball moving during a in 2008. So it does swing a little bit, and I thought it saved the building. So this is shot inside the pocket. So you set the variables where you think they should be, then you hit a button that takes you outside the building, and then you're able to make an earthquake happen. So with this toggle button on the bottom, you're moving it back and forth with the mouse, or you're either shaking the hand controller. And as you shake the hand controller in VR, the building will either you know, burst or not, depending on the how you set the two mass. Yeah, so we're actively working on that. It's getting better and better all the time. Break apart is looking good. The rocking and equation, it's a beautiful thing. Then I hit forward this one. And then no, I'm here at the thank you slide. So thank you all for coming. And uh, I would love to take questions. And please feel free to email me anytime at this address or the Invited Games address. And it's been wonderful to speak to you. So, um, Amina, that was great. I really enjoyed it. I love the building. Uh, um, that you, that you, the building game you showed. Um, can you talk a little bit about the students who are building these experiences? Because you are based in psychology, right? And are these students coming from other, other departments or? Uh -huh, yeah, it's interesting because, oh yeah, I had a hard time finding good coders in psychology. And right. now I've been sort of partnering with the, uh, the computer science people and uh, one of our very crossover cross disciplinary schools called School of Arts, Media, and Engineering. And so we're able to find more students who are interested in learning Unity. And uh, that's been great. So I've been sort of mentoring those students. And, you know, I'm kind of used to working with professionals as well. So when I'm grant funded, and actually I'm poor right now, but I've often had grant money, but when I have grant money, I go out and hire professionals because they work twice as quickly. But so it's actually kind of a good thing that I'm poor because I'm being to like work with these students and work on their time frame. So that's that's actually been really good for me and, and good to learn that that they can learn quickly, right? When they have good mentoring, I mean I've seen taking a student in, in four months and then they're coding in Unity and building stuff that looks good. You know, you have to give them some guidance, but they can build the game. So that's been really wonderful to watch. Cool, thank you. There's also some, uh, you know, people are building now these like really low bar editors in VR. So I just met this interesting woman who runs a company called Ape Lab. And I don't know if any of you know Ape Lab. That she has this thing called Zoe.com, Z O E.com. And uh, it was just really, a really easy enter, grab items, grab trees, and they start growing. And so you can build your VR environment in real time in the headset without coding. So I think that's going to be the future, right? Those kind of editors that are. I'm going to look up UB Sim later, Jeffrey, because I'm a big believer in this kind of world that lets anyone enter and start start creating.
So Mina, um, I had a quick question. Um, and that was, uh, it's kind of twofold. One is, um, what kind of increase in interest have you seen from the students um, in XR over the last, say, three or four years? And then also, can you just speak a little bit about what you're doing to manage the COVID era within the school and uh, manage, managing the use of HMDs? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of interest. It's increasing all the time. For the COVID stuff, we had we had some studies set up, which of course couldn't happen because you know we have the Psych 101 pool that students have. They get credit for doing the studies, and that's just really good to pull from. And students come into a small room and they put on a headset, and then they come in one after another, like seven in a in a day, and it's a beautiful thing. But that's not happening. All that has stopped most universities. So we've had to be creative about setting up in rooms and putting a camera in there, and then you leave, and then the student comes in all alone and goes through the experience. So right now we're running a study with actually AR, so called AR Net. I'm gonna, I'll send it later. But it's like, what you're doing is you're taking your phone, you're tapping on it and showing the vectors of the magnetic field in an overlay situation, and how do students learn from that versus a hands-on uh, compass and, uh, you know, that's something that they, they come to the lab and they pick up the materials for it, the little compasses and little magnets, and then they go to their own home and they turn on their Zoom camera and they do a think aloud and they, they go through for tests that we gave them. And so we're just having to do these kind of one-on-one -on -one experiments where they send us the video link later and we go over it and score it and score the paper materials after they've been mailed to us. So everything's just slowed down to a crawl, but it's still going on. I guess my prediction is, is that, I don't know, if it's not fall, then it'll be spring a year from now when research will be back to normal. Oh. Are you using a clean box technology at all, Nina? Uh, I am not, but the uh, construction people are. So they're doing a study actually right now with um, HoloLens 2, and they have a couple of clean boxes, and so they're, they're hanging them up in there with the UV rays and getting them cleaned up. So that's another good choice. Thank you. In the back there. You can just unmute yourself. Yeah, for me, and this is me, because some people think just using your eyes as vision is embodied, but I would call that very low embodied. So for me, it means that you are using your body to make things happen on the screen. And so that can either mean like if you're using the connect sensor, you're holding your hand out front and moving icons around on the screen, or if you're locomoting around, like if you're in a cave, and there's motion capture and, and you moving is being mapped to the frequency of a ball on the floor. And now you're learning about velocity by the way you move your body. That for me is a good example of body. So Mana, did you, would you say then that um, uh, that's independent of, of perspective? So uh, in other words, you don't actually have to be in first person, uh, um, uh, have the first person view in order to be engaging in uh, embodied activities? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Uh, because first person, like if you're looking down at your avatar and doing things with your virtual arm, I have to suspect that's going to be more embodied and meaningful to you as, as an embodied avatar. Right. But maybe that's not the case. I don't know yet. No one's done that experiment that I've seen. Because, you know, in the building, the TMD one, you're flying outside the building almost like God, right? So you you jump back and forth between a first person point of view and a third person to see the evidence of what you brought. So uh, that's a game that 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 is putting both points of view in there 
And I consider it embodied because you're starting the earthquake by shifting your hand left and right. And the faster you shift, the higher the magnitude of the earthquake. So that's one way I tried to map a gesture that's congruent to the content being learned. But it's not necessarily a first person point of view. Right. Yeah. So just this. But you, idea, I guess you've I'll... given me a good idea for an experiment. Yeah, right. I, I, I have. So I think maybe I should make two conditions one where you're always in first person point of view, and one where you can jump back and forth. Yeah, that'd be really interesting. Do you start the game looking through the eyes of the avatar in the first person, or do you start the game with you're just behind looking at the avatar's head like we are in here in Verbella? You know, actually, because game is embedded in the construction room, we needed to figure out a way to get them ready to leave the crane game, an open outside world, go into this the top 100 story floor, this tower. So how are we going to do that? Oh, well, let's put them in an elevator. So now they step into an elevator with first person point of view, and in front of them is a screen that starts flashing the tutorial. So they're getting ready for it, right? So as they go up, and there's like these weird like Star Trek lights going whoosh, whoosh, making you feel like you're going up in an elevator. Yeah. And as you as you go upwards, you're getting these text panels that are telling you you're a structural engineer and this is your first job and you have to save the building. And then you're also getting exposure to the uh, to the three variables that you're going to set, right? Like, so we're telling you, here's mass, here's what it looks like, and here's the K for the piston. And try to keep it simple and accessible, but also get them ready for when they enter that room in the first person POV. They, they know what to do. But it takes about a minute to go through the elevator. That's cool. Yeah. Sounds like a little bit like that video game Portal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Nothing's new, huh? All been done before. No, very, very, very good UX though to, to get them engaged and you know th through into it. That's cool. Oh, uh -huh. that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, there's an egocentric perspective and an exocentric perspective. So you can look at the doll's house from the outside, or you can be inside the doll's house as the doll. And then there's a bicentric perspective where you go back and forth. And the bicentric is, is, um, the most powerful. Most people get it about the exocentric, but they have trouble imagining the egocentric. They have trouble becoming the Tao if they're looking at the house from the outside. Yeah, well, I, I can. Uh, yeah, I can add to it that uh, on my research, uh, which which was done on uh, understanding the um, astrophysics of the solar system. Uh, I can encompass it like uh, if you can uh, view from the eagle point of view, uh, system point of view, and then go down to the B view, like uh, examining the objects. And if you can switch between these, it's not a point of view, it's like different frame of references. So if you have the ability to change your frame of reference and you're like a dolphin, so you can jump and catch the fish in the air, but you can also dive down. This is the best, uh, the best option for for kids for um, for learning a complex system. Um, by the way, you can be misled and you can uh, build a misconception. But this is another topic. But uh, actually, I agree. If you give a lot of uh, flexibility uh, in POV, like a point of view, and also in the frame of reference, uh, the probability are that um, you will learn more, and the learning occurs uh, not within the actions, but afterwards in the reflective. Um, the best uh, metaphor that I can think of is a uh, fighting pilot. The Israeli fighting pilots learn most when they do uh, after 
after battle, uh, how do I say, uh, reflection and um, what, watch how, what they did, uh, like a reflective uh, uh, way. And it also goes for understanding complex system in virtual reality. Well, I like that you said the probability of learning is increased because, yeah, it's probably it is probabilistic depending on how well you designed your content, right? Because it could also be overwhelming. So if you're a low knowledge learner, having too much control over your point of view, overwhelming. But uh, Chris, thank you for mentioning that sense article. I do. I talk to my students all the time about exo egocentric and exocentric views. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, Mina, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I just wanted to circle back to, to measurement in the environment um, and cognitive load. What's your take on um, the best way to measure cognitive load? Is it uh, EDA or is what are you finding is, is the most effective? Yeah, touched on a touchy subject. <laughs> I think there aren't a lot of great measures of cognitive load. I think people are not good at reporting it for themselves post facto. And so I know a lot of people use the taxel thing. Um, I guess if I were to look deeply at cognitive load, what I do is I try to design all my content to be low cognitive load. So that goes back to Dr. Jules' point. Like I try to design things to be low cognitive load and then I measure learning. So to get it high load, I think I would start to use more biometric measures and then verify those, correlate those with self-reported load afterwards. But it's not something I work deeply on. I just try to design to have low intrinsic load to what I scaffold up the complexity. So, yeah. Jerry, do you have your hand up? Are you muted? Hi. Hi, Mina. How are you? Good. How are you? Um, yeah, so my work is mostly with uh, K-12 uh, elementary and middle school students. And so in the work that you're describing, I know you have a pool of undergrads that you're able to do testing with, but how much, what have you, what are your experiences working with K-12 students? Yeah. With VR? yeah. Thank you for asking. I, you know, I don't have heaps because they're so hard to get hold of. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, so it's been really like informal going into a friend who does Hour of Code and working with his daughter's fifth grade class, right? So I haven't oh, wow. done big studies in VR with 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 younger students yet. Um, but I am interested in them. And I will tell you this, that when I tried to get my game, Catch a Mimic, which is super appropriate for fifth graders and up, into the Oculus yeah. store, I said as much. I was like, oh, okay, this is this is great for, you know, fourth graders and up. And I got really dinged. They wouldn't put it up there. I got dinged for that. They're like, no, no, we only allow, what is it, 13 years old over to be in a headset. So I had to change my description and resubmit the game. Yeah, that so, was my experience too, right. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's going to change or not, but uh, it, people are just, I, I, just, I just feel like there's nervousness out there. There in the middle school. Is that what you're saying? People don't want to put middle school kids in headsets. Well, I, I, because of IRB and everything, I didn't want to go against the recommendations of the device, you know, mm -hmm. saying a design for ages 13 and up, which is just an overly cautious, you know, uh, thing. But I think it's true that, it, that there's always going to be a percentage of students that is uncomfortable in a headset. And so, you know, having things, well, like yours, where you can also run it on a desktop computer, you know, makes it more accessible. Yeah, we always try to do that, make it WebGL also. And then mm -hmm. I'm kind of excited about these new open source places, although it's been a nightmare uh, porting stuff into WebXR. So I don't know if anyone else has done that, but if you have a lot of interactivity in your system, it's just not set up for that yet. So there's a lot of, Acts you have to work through, you know, kind of a brave new world. Well, I remember playing with your your game two years ago at AERA when we did that showcase. So it was mm -hmm. uh, it's fun to see where it's gone. Thank you.
Thank you. Nice to see you. <laughs> Uh, so I, I see a question uh, in the chat uh, from KP, uh, who asks, uh, how do we alleviate the concerns around uh, the 13-year-old age limit for head-mounted displays? Yeah, kind of scientists, I'm going to say, you take 100 13-year-olds and put them in for 100 hours, and you take 100 and don't do that, and check on that them at 16 years old. I don't know. You know, I'm just like everything in moderation, right? I think a kid 20 minutes in a headset every four days is not going to do any damage. That's a longitudinal study. Someone needs to. Right. <laughs> everything in moderation, including moderation. Yeah, big round of applause for Nina. Amazing. Wow, I'm so, always so inspired after listening to you talk and seeing all the cool things that you're up to. Just amazing. Wow. Um, we're lucky here at iLearn that uh, Mina has recently uh, um, joined us on the, the organizing committee for the iLearn 2021 conference, which is up on the upper right. Uh, screen there. There's our, our we just released our call for papers and presentations. Um, so that'll be happening mid May through sort of mid June. Um, we're spreading it across a longer period of time so people can spend you know uh, time engaging with the community uh, and not be so uh, super bedraggled after at you know doing it for an entire week. Uh, eight hours a day or whatever. And we're also accommodating of, of uh, times around the world in this way. Um, so kind of moving to a, a new format, um, we'll be creating and building uh, to that event uh, starting now because we're here on the campus and uh, we've got, iLearn has a number of different initiatives, which uh, Mark and I'd like to chat with you about, but the idea is that, you know, since this is where we will be holding the conference, uh, we'd like to engage you and others um, across this XR community uh, with, you know, good intentions focused on learning and helping uh, underserved populations uh, work through this, what we see is probably going to be a very difficult winter that doesn't take too much of a crystal ball to see we've got, <clears throat> work to do and we've got things uh, going on um, well this this pandemic is going to probably you know continue to create challenges for us and then emerge in the spring um, coming out of the coming out of things um, and all of this is happening right around as XR uh, is uh, really I think kind of poised to, to make another another leap another another jump um so so yeah i thought we would talk to you uh, for a few minutes about what is going on with iLearn and what iLearn is um uh, mark you want to yeah i can i can i can kick off and uh you know feel free to chime in john so i guess we should go back to to what uh what ireland is um so uh we're a, a global uh immersive learning research network iLearn uh, is a, a, a global nonprofit association. Uh, we now have around uh, 6,000 uh, members from across the, the globe um, who are educators, researchers, um, as well as developers uh, who uh, are um, dedicated to realizing the scientific, technical, and applied potential of uh, XR immersive technologies for supporting learning. 
uh, we're, we're sector agnostic um, and with immersive learning research network rather than the immersive education research network. So we, we take quite a broad perspective on learning uh, across the, the lifespan. Um, uh, and we, we like to say that our, our mission is to cultivate these communities of research, uh, innovation, and also very importantly, evidence-based um, practice uh, around what works um, in uh, XR and immersive learning. Um, we have a number of uh, uh, in uh, strategic uh, a number of initiatives that we uh, that the net that the uh, the board has sort of, uh, set as priorities uh, for us in the in, in the coming years. Uh, as John mentioned, we have the the conference, which has really been our flagship uh, initiative since our uh, our founding uh, in two thousand and fourteen. Um, in addition to the conference, we also have the State of XR and Immersive Learning uh, project. Um, Ma I think Maya and Emery uh, mm -hmm. are in, in the room. <laughs> um, uh, Ma Maya, Emery, um, Maya and Emery, along with Brian Alexander, uh, uh, Jonathan, and myself are um, sort of the, 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 the writing team, the key uh, around on the state of um, working on the state of XR and immersive learning, uh, which um, ha has two kind of key components. The first being to conduct a some style um, and an annually recurring horizon style um, uh, environmental scanning and, and future forecasting exercise around uh, um, the, the I guess the uh, the most promising uh, developments, needs and opportunities, uh, as well as uh, challenges and barriers um, that are, are, are um, re relevant to the field of XR and immersive learning. Uh, and the second component of that of that project, um, still in its 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 very early stages, uh, is to uh, build a a knowledge or evidence base. Um, uh, uh, based on on empirical research that that, that uh, has been conducted um, uh, as a as a means of or as a basis for deriving uh, evidence based design principles and guidelines uh, to help the uh, advanced practice in the field. Uh, how am I doing, John? Is there any, anything I've missed? Good about the conference or the state of XR? Uh, nope. Do we, um, maybe a little mention of the, the expert panel? Um, the, the... Good point. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, we'll, we'll soon be putting out a call for uh, participation in the, in the, in our, in the next uh, round or next iteration of the state of XR, uh, what we're calling the Outlook uh, report. Uh, for, for 2021, um, so this this um, each year we have a, a, a an expert panel of around a, a hundred um, uh, researchers and practitioners from across the world who uh, uh, collaborate with us on this Delphi inspired um, uh, exercise. Uh, that we use to to answer the the, the three uh, overarching research questions around the state of XR and immersive learning. Um, so yeah, just so um, I mean, what what Mark has described, right, with this knowledge base of the research, right? A lot of the folks here, um, you know, are very familiar with research. You know, it takes it takes money. It takes effort and it takes time. And so from, you know, conceiving of a research project, putting in the, getting the, the proposal or the funding for it, you know, going out into the field and gathering the data and then um, finally analyzing the data, writing it up and getting it into publication takes time and effort and resources, right? So um, there's usually a little bit of a lag time between what you're reading in the research 
and that leading edge of innovation in technology. And so I learned with this future forecast is trying to create um, the other end, that other bookend, sort of this emerging front of what's happening um, in these innovations. So working with these, these hundred plus experts from around the world, uh, we hope to keep uh, producing sort of um, a, a, an active living document of what's on this emerging cutting edge for XR for learning. So, uh, yeah. Should we, uh, should we talk about some of the other, yeah. another, another initiatives? Um, I don't want to put, don't want to put uh, Maya on the spot, but perhaps we could um, give a bit of a, a, a plug to checks. Right. So not only is Maya working on uh, as an author and helping us lead in the state of XR project, but she's also helping us and leading in uh, the checks uh, initiative. And uh, Mark, what is checks? Uh, so um, I don't steal Maya's thunder, but uh, check stands for champions in higher education, uh, champions in higher education for XR. Um, yes. So, so Amaya, did you want to say a few words about, about checks and, yeah. and the work that um, you're doing with David and Jeremy? Uh, thank you, Mark and Jonathan and Mina. Um, it's always great to be in a, in a group of people interested in, in exploring XR and, you know, the future of learning. Um, checks is a group of, um, really, I think researchers and in a very, in, in a broader sense, practitioners and educators um who are you know basically pioneering this technology in within the edu within the higher education context um so uh it's an amazing group of people uh who are you know attempting to bring this uh technology to education on um, some of them have, some of us are very much on the ground with students at the same time we also interface with um you know the greatest challenges and in in whether it's in the pandemic or in terms of facing access, accessibility, um, but we also get the opportunity to um, really be on a forefront in a, an amazing sort of field. And um, with my colleagues, um, Jeremy Nielsen and David uh, Basic-Clark, we um, lead this group um, and this will be in the inaugural semester for this group, which was kind of really f uh, started at the IORN conference back in June, um, and uh, we uh, meet monthly um, and attempt, you know, the, sort of our first set of meetings. At the moment, we have a lot of, a set of um, very interesting inquiries and a set of, we've also um, uh, facilitated a set of conversations during our monthly meetings uh, around uh, really stemming from, you know, what, um, what are we doing with different disciplines from art and design to architecture to uh, engineering? Um, and also, how do we manage this technology in this world? And uh, how do we manage the expectations of our students and engagement? Uh, and uh, so, as I mentioned, some, some of the questions have come on a very practical level. Some are very research oriented and some of them are uh, really um, inspiring that next generation of, of students and creators. Um, we, if you want to join us, uh, we also have a, um, I'm going to try to put the website in a moment. Um, so you can join the, uh, this community, uh, participate in the meetings and participate in our future opportunities for engagement, um, with the broader higher education community. Fantastic. Uh, th thanks Maya. So, um. Correct me if I'm wrong. At last count, I think we had about sixty or seventy. Was it sixty or seventy um, higher education institutions uh, represented in in, in checks? Yes, um, that is correct. And uh, uh, we do, I think, believe we have something like at least twenty plus countries in our inaugural group, which I know at this point we've added to. Uh, and I think one of the unique opportunities. Uh, in doing anything with IWAR and, uh, and, you know, Mark and Jonathan is the opportunity to work within a global community. 
and it truly is it is truly you know happens at the at the conference in june when we actually you know become so aware of people you know staying really late or waking really up to join us and same um i think while there are many communities that exist uh with you know in in regional uh, context um uh, both czech and the i czechs and the iowa community uh, uh you know just benefit from this just amazing global perspective Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 I learned really is hoping to really empower um, people around the globe from lots of different perspectives. Um, you know that the checks is is particularly special from the higher education perspective because there's you know lots of people on these campuses who are the uh, the appointed um, kind of person or people in in, in placed in charge of. XR for learning across various disciplines, or sometimes they're the de, the de facto leaders, um, and so that's that's a really per, uh, special perspective that I, we're proud to help cultivate and support. Um, we also just launched uh, um, XR Women, uh, which is a, a project by um, Karen Alexander and uh, uh, Julie Simpson. And uh, so we, that just started yesterday. Every Wednesday, we're having uh, meetings here on the Iron campus um, as a place to cultivate um, and celebrate uh, women in the XR uh, community. And we, we're hoping that that will grow uh, quickly. Um, another great- uh, John, Sorry, John, Karen's here. So, you know, we should allow Karen to say a few words uh, about of course. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no problem. No problem at all. Um, yeah, so so this is a, a new um, venture and it's very loosely organized at this point. But as uh, Jonathan said, we are meeting every Wednesday um, in the blue events room in the events pavilion here in on the iLearn campus. Um, right now we are going to be there between 9 and 12 Eastern time on Wednesdays, which is difficult for people on the West Coast, I understand. But we hope to get enough people involved that we can have representation uh, from people in time zones all around the world or, or some convenient time for them to come in to network to um, share the success of uh, women in the industry and in education and to support one another and um, to advocate for more women in presenting roles and for, so they can have more visibility um, in XR events. Yeah, super. So we'd love to, you know, if anyone would like to, to join, I'll, I'll put my um, email address in the chat. Um, we are working on getting our, um, social media together. Uh, there's also an email for the group, globalxrwomen at gmail.com. I'll put that and my personal email address in the chat. Awesome. And thanks to, thanks to you, Jonathan and Mark, for um, allowing us to be on the iLearn Canvas for that event. No, it's, it's our honor. Thank you. Thank you. So another um, another thing we've been doing on campus is um, engaging with different uh, groups on, in the geographic uh, chapters. Uh, so right now uh, we're working with um, some partners in Ecuador uh, to to launch uh, their VR days, which will be happening. Uh, that's this Saturday, isn't it, Mark? That's right, this uh, Saturday. And so uh, different uh, chapters are forming. Um, uh, so we have the Ecuador, and uh, which was actually helped along very nicely um, by Jorge Acosta Baca um, uh, of our Colombia uh, chapter, um, which is probably the strongest um, consistently meeting and developing with lots of different uh, seminars and uh, collaboration with industry within the region of Colombia. Uh, Jorge has just done an amazing job at uh, building capacity uh, with that. 
but we've also got a lot of interest coming from Canada um, and a number of colleges in Canada are now joining the iLearn campus, um, which is another initiative that iLearn is leasing space to like-minded organizations, whether they're nonprofit organizations, um, universities, colleges, uh, and others uh, to join us on the campus to sort of collaborate together, co-design uh, uh, using Verbella and exploring um, the metaverse, as it were. Um, so there's, there's a lot of um, um, great sort of partner agreements that we've been engaging with um, to, uh, to, to, to make the campus come alive. Um, so the idea is that the campus, people can get their private spaces here on campus. So we can give projects, teams, organizations, um, private space uh, within Verbella, just like you can on the open campus. But we're looking, of course, with ed 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 educational or like-minded organizations, ed tech. Um, and then we also um, together are cre creating life across the campus in terms of learning and seminars and design projects, hackathons, game jams, um, uh, game nights, the you know movie nights, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's our campus partners are are joining us to help kind of co-create that buzz across campus, so that. You won't just interact with only the students of your university uh, or your project, but there's lots of great things happening um, here. So, uh, Mark, uh, you want another yeah, initiative? Just, yeah, well, just to just to add to uh, what you just um, talked about, Jonathan, um, we kind of think we, we we kind of think of that that aspect of. Of the island virtual campus is, is sort of being like a like a like a co-working space for um organizations and institutions interested in in xr for learning um so the idea is that the organization the 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 various institutions and organizations have their own private spaces on the campus but then they're they they are also part of a vibrant community in the in the public or open uh part of the campus which we're, we're, on, we're on now, um, where there are uh, myriad uh, different activities, uh, events and other activities happening. And one of those activities is um, uh, led by my, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Lindy Orwin from, from, uh, from Australia, um, who will be uh, starting in January of next year, um, running an initiative called the uh, I Learn in, in, intrepid educators uh, group, uh, okay. which will which will uh, meet uh, monthly at, uh, at least I think uh, on this campus to explore uh, different uh, techniques, uh, strategies, and approaches for using uh, 3D uh, virtual environments like Verbella uh, for learning and teaching. Um, sort of share, sharing. Uh, uh, d d different um, t tips and tricks um, uh, grounded in, in, in the research and the, and the evidence and the theory. Awesome. Oh, I didn't realize that. Hello to everyone on on the Zoom. <laughs> oh yeah, hi. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's hang out and uh, you know we, we're John and I are happy to chat, take any questions, and also to show you around. Absolutely.
<laughs> Thank you all for coming. Mike, wake up. Oh, that's really fun. Yeah, I appreciate it. Mike, you wake. Jonathan, I'm gonna I'm gonna take off. I'm gonna skip the tour, but um, I just to say you're looking very distinguished this evening. <laughs> We we switched the campus to, for a few minutes to look at the Christmas uh, decorations and kind of think about planning for the holiday party. Ah, and I, so, I and there's like all these cool holiday um, costume things, and I just was like, oh, I kind of like this. I look, like, I'm, I'm going to keep this. I'm. It's, it's it's a different look for you, but it's but it's good. <laughs> My winter look. <laughs> I'm aging quickly. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> glad that worked out. It was, yeah. it was okay, a good well, um, uh, so thank you nice. both. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip out. Um, uh, I think I've done the most of the the tours. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Are, are you yeah. coming to Pie and Coffee tomorrow? Yeah, I, you? I feel uh, I am need to yes. collect new data. So okay. you know that's right. We talked about that. Hey, we'll see. See All you right. both. I might have to run. Okay. Thanks, okay. Karen. I'm gonna thank you. Head out too. Okay, appreciate it. Bye bye. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs>
Yes. Or are you going to do the tour for us? Yes. <laughs> oh, you're really on double tour duty. For you. Yes. It's, it's... Okay. You don't have to if you want to go chat with people. Okay. Um, no, I'm, I want to do this. This was wonderful. I've, I'm super interested in quite a few things that came up and have things I want to share with some of these people. So, huh. Great. Do you know who that, that guy was? The, the fellow was? The, I looked him. I, yeah. I couldn't. I, I tried to figure it out by Google. Is his name El Hanan Gazit? Do you know if that's him? Um, I, uh, it is Hanan. Uh, but um, I have yeah, his email. Hanan? I have his email. And Great. Good. Good. So that's I, probably better than Meetup and sending him something on, on, on uh, Meetup. Is he in the U.S. or is he in no, Israel? He's so in Julot Israel. is the company. He's in Israel. Which is in Israel. Um, so I figured. Yeah, yeah I'd, I love can, to, I'd love to ask. I him can more. introduce you. Um, yeah. Damn it! Do you know him? Have you talked to him? Or, sorry, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Him. I'm trying to. <sighs> oh, there it is. Whoops. Oh. <laughs> Ah, Jonathan, uh, uh, let's see, go to, there we are. Oh, wow. There he is. The uh, Innovation Garden Studios. John, do you want to talk about, a bit about mm -hmm. Innovation Garden Studios? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a place for us to um, kind of using the, the Stanford design model or the IDEO or um, the sort of the, the design thinking uh, and innovation lab idea. Uh, we want to start a, or we are starting an innovation garden instead of an innovation factory um, where we cultivate uh, the seeds of good ideas. Uh, so it's a place where uh, winners of project uh, competitions like hackathons or game jams at the end they oftentimes want to actually have a place to cultivate uh, the things they worked on over the weekend and we want to offer a place for that uh, different project teams can uh, use the spaces uh, and we'll, we'll we've got um, some United States Department of Agriculture uh, facilitation training sessions uh, for pe people to become uh, master gardeners and help other people uh, to innovate uh, here. Uh, we've also got some grant writing workshops uh, that we're starting and getting going. So we're talking about uh, not only seeds of innovation, but seeds of uh, seed money for projects. Um, uh, so, so the Innovation Gardens is uh, our, our office spaces and we can go inside and take a look. Um, at, at the office I don't think they can actually active because yeah they, we should be able to go in except you and I John will have to use our go to menu that's right <laughs> um, so you can walk inside the innovation labs you can take a look at our office suites uh, these are the these are one of the uh, popular Hey Jeff. Hey Jeff. Hey Jeff. Whoop. He disappeared. Yeah, so uh, um, oh, there he is. these are office suites and uh, they're actually, uh, the owners can size them. So if you're looking in that direction right now and you look to the back, uh, this is a small size office space. I'm gonna make it a medium size. Did you see the rooms just got added? Uh, I can make it large and I can, or I can extend it and I can change the number of boardrooms. So from one boardroom uh, all the way up to two boardrooms and two meeting spaces. And this, and it's outfitted with private volumes, meaning that if you step over a blue line, no one can hear you on the other side of the blue line and vice versa. So there's these little uh, kind of water cooler chat spaces. You've got offices. If you step into the office, it's a private space. You'll hear the bloop, bloop 
and that means you've just crossed over into a private volume. But and everyone, sh everyone should be able to change the, the configuration, the furniture configurations in the offices. So that's maybe someone, something uh, folks might want to try. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but then there's also you'll notice these uh, these end caps here. If I step over, you know, we can all watch a movie or something at the end uh, at these end caps, or these informal spaces kind of in between. Um, Get in the in the auditorium, or I mean, in the conference hall. Um, so those are very useful for people to share in teams. Um, and why we're opening it up um, as an innovation garden for uh, different teams of different campuses, universities, organizations, etc., to populate this space and really get it hopping with XR innovation um, expertise uh, from from you know, graduate students or undergraduate students all the way up to uh, Chris Deedy and <laughs> the rock stars of XR. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm just, I just did a, a quick thing. So these, these uh, office spaces are all um, brand <laughs> Like you, you can, uh, if you have moderator privileges, you can um, upload logos and, and images to, uh, on onto the different doors and, and 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 onto the different spaces on on the walls. Oh, look at that logo! I wonder how it got there. Yes. Yeah, but <laughs> feel free to step into one of the offices and and check them out. Cool. So this uh, the sound in this room is isolated. Uh, so, so so you should see a um, you should see a. <laughs> an option at the top of the window that says office configurations. Oh, cool. Um, oh. And you use that to, to change the, the layout of the furniture. Sweet. Yeah. Sweet. That's really neat. And uh, these boards. So when I upload something to a screen, is it going to live forever in some database? No. Uh, or nope. It's all it's all secure through Amazon Web Services. It's all it's it's pretty it's private. As soon as you dis if you, as you disappear it, it's gone. Okay. Cool. Restaurants nearby. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, how we've got this particular suite set up is anyone. Uh, can can make use of the web boards, uh, right? So, so anyone here, e even a, even visitors, can go onto the web boards and um, throw up different websites on them, uh, throw up a Google Google documents and collaborate on them, uh, which is, is something we find uh, really useful. Uh, in in other spaces like the presentation spaces, we restrict um, uh, who is able to to manipulate what's on the boards to. Uh, moderators only huh cool yeah so this is the place to come for brainstorming and and you know really opening up the collaboration tools whereas you don't want to give that power to a whole crowd of people that you want to kind of control for for a presenter who's taking time out of his or her right you know day so, oh, this day yeah, yeah so, you know it occurs to me that third person view lets you see your avatar so you know where you are in space and who's near you, which you normally see through your peripheral vision and your others. <laughs> but yeah. that's but that's not available with a desktop interface. But with third person, you get that. That's right. And and by the way, you can actually I believe um, you should be able to do this in, in the chat. If you type forward slash cam, C-A-M, that changes your camera view. Oh. If you're, on, on, if you're using the desktop uh, client. Oh, wow. Okay. So now I'm first person. Sweet. Chris Didi was asking about that. 
Interesting. So yeah. I have a question. Yeah. What's on the screen over here? Um, someone asked for restaurants nearby. Is that what everyone's seeing? Yeah, I did that. That's right. Uh, and yes. Okay. So, we so the restaurants I'm seeing are all very close to where I'm sitting right now in the real world. Is anyone else seeing that? That's right. So, yeah. so everyone gets a, a season in uh, a separate instance. Um, really? Oh. On the board. Yeah. Oh, because okay, I'm so, seeing my neighborhood. And yeah, so if I, if I right now, if I change it to Did bars, a, can they say, hear me? would everyone see bars that are near them? Yeah. Yeah. You should do so. So, so there. Um, when you throw up a website, uh, the default is everyone gets a a separate instance of the web browser. Ah, uh, okay, I get it. What you can also do is you can sh share your screen. Um, and then what's okay. coming? Uh, what's um, imminent? You know, in the next few weeks, is. Uh, uh, the ability to live stream, Vervel is going to give us the ability to live stream into the platform. Um, so you can have a YouTube live stream, for example, piped in so that everyone actually sees the same live stream. Cool. Uh, but you can, yeah, if you, if you click on uh, uh, the, one of these web boards, um, you should see at the bottom of your screen, you see a, a kind of a web browser toolbar um, next to the URL, um, actually the third button to the right of the URL is a, is a square, share screen, uh, screen sharing feature. So there's native screen sharing. And then the one after that is uh, webcam. So you can actually um, Yeah, Mark, okay, I think cool. they're now ready to be blown away with uh, with the uh, pop up. Wait, 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 did Mark leave? Cross the sound barrier. Womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, a... Oh, yeah, my my um, uh, um, client crashed because I had my webcam. Uh, my webcam was being used by another application. <laughs> oh, I was just I just said, Mark. I think they're now totally primed for the, the, to be blown away by the pop up and you... oh, the pop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can do things. You... Can't hear you. Can't can hear me? Okay. Yeah, now I can. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so you can, you can also, the other thing you can do is, um, you know, instead of relying people to, uh, relying on people to zoom into the boards themselves, you can actually, uh, um, if you're a presenter um, or a moderator, you can actually force, um, a pop up on their on, on everyone's uh, screen uh, with a with a particular website. So, for example, hello, hello. Yep, he's. He, I think he's manipulating a website. Popped oh. out. There it is. <laughs> yeah, so you can you can wow. if you're a generator you can you can uh you can push we have control of it too. We also yeah. have control. Yeah, so we'll often put up like uh quiz, like an interactive quiz, you know, a, a website that offers these these basic web 2.0 teaching tools you can use to engage your group interactively. Um, so you could, you could put up a quiz. Where do you want to go next? Or what did you think of that presenter? Or you know what you could do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I can do a quick one. 
Like can you create a program, a special program for that? They're just like, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of those. Yeah, the, the one that I like to out use. on the web. Yeah, one okay. of them that I like to use is called Poll Everywhere. Um, so, so these are third party websites, um, you know, nothing to do with Rebella. Okay. So just web based tools. So I can just let me quickly do this. Like a survey monkey idea. But they've got like interactive whiteboards where people can draw or, you know, there's like collage things where you can drop photos, ifs, and think, you know, write it on, you can write in freehand on it. And those are kind of fun. So, yeah. That is strictly controlled by them and because they're being so much business right now, so much demand, the minimum level right now is about $10,000 if you want something custom done because they're just working on the, the things that can affect all of the campuses and they, they just don't have the personnel. It's just a gold rush. It's amazing. So, yeah. No, it's it's so this is like kind of the polar opposite of Second Life in that way. There's there's so little user content, um, and we I mean they could have customized. We could have told them what we wanted, and then it would have taken them some time to set it up that way. But um, we didn't have any time to do to come up with a design for our campus, so it looks just like their Verbella open campus without much modification whatsoever, because we received this campus one week before the iLearn 2020 conference. <laughs> so, and we, yeah, there's, and as you can see, there's a lot to figure out. So we had to basically just run around campus, decorate everything, try and figure out how to onboard people, get a crew, you know, a skeleton crew to, to kind of take care of different aspects the prov provisioning the different areas of the of the thing, put it into the program, and we were running. <laughs> but um, it's taken us the months since the conference that we've really been figuring out how to actually uh, do it because it's it's complex. Um, yeah. So so there are about a dozen different pre-configured room types that we can just clone and. Um, and and either add to the go to menu or and add to the go to menu and or place behind different doors on the campus, and that's how, that's how that's how it works. Um, <laughs> yeah, <the Five>. <laughs> we discovered our anti-COVID fund, so we have to get everybody in the room to occupy the exact same avatar space. It's hey, Mr. V, Mr. VR over there. Oh, well, I thought if two Jeffs occupied the same space, there might be some sort of like, uh, you know, antimatter explosion or something, but apparently not. <laughs> There's Star Trek here. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we, uh, shall we walk, walk and talk? Um, yeah, we got to check out maybe a boardroom. And before yeah, let's we... go to the boardroom. Uh, Up around. Yeah, that's great. Right. And that's right. And, and frame is what we actually use when we, when we need greater control over the, the design of the environment, right? Um, you know, especially when we want students, for example, to be able to, to create their own uh, artifacts and, and, and environments. But yeah, here's, here's the, the boardroom. Um, any cocktails? So yeah, this is the 
the, the waiting room, but through these doors is the full. Kurt can't hear us, of course. He's crossed over into the private. <laughs> there, there you can hear us, Kurt. I was on the rug. I couldn't hear anybody. Yeah, you crossed the blue line, man. Yep. Ooh. All right. So make, through these doors is the boardroom. Out there. there you go. Looks nice. Good fun to take the boat. Yeah, that was so strange how you can't get it from the VR menu. Oh, yeah. So the, the speed boats are probably one of the more popular features of of the campus. So you you feel free to to hop in. And you click. <laughs> this is so there funny. Is <laughs> I was trying to figure it out. <laughs> Crazy. Um, I think if I, if I switch to the desktop, I can do it. Yeah, you, you gotta click, click on one. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Jeff, are you still in your headset or are you, um, desktop? Oh, okay. Um, if you want, if you, you feel free to drive. <laughs> if you, uh, click on the, just click on the steering wheel. This is so frustrating. Go behind the boat. You can see, at least I can see it from behind it. Oh, yeah, Maybe not. Uh, <laughs> how do you how do you interact like this? I don't think you can within the VR headset yet. I mean, is there a gas pedal somewhere? Oh, 
Good fun, isn't it? <laughs> this is great. This is great. Yeah, we learned some good. important information tonight. I didn't know the, about the age restriction on the headsets. That's an, an arbitrary number that they've just, you know. I'm a bad parent. I put my kid in a headset. <laughs> Under seven. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not like they're, you know, not like they're, they're, they're in it for, you know, hours and hours on end every day. I mean. She's only 19 months old. She was only in the little, like, Google Cardboard. We didn't put her in the Oculus, but she loves, she thought that was the funniest thing she'd ever seen. Yeah. And the, uh, it's a, I suppose the main was the main concern just the just the spatial aspects and not so much the content with the age group. Yeah. Hmm. Could use a few. Uh, biplanes out there in the water, you know. Yeah. Deep <laughs> yeah. That fan oh, plane, I like couldn't even drive the boat. You want to be the fly? You have to learn first, right? <laughs> well, that's that's okay. You, you, you're covered in that area, so uh, I've I, got a pilot's license, so we, we, we let's go for a fly. <laughs> I think so, being able to fly would be very nice as well, to fly between places rather than walk, but Perhaps that would be too radical. I don't know. It, it feels kind of wrong because it's it's nighttime for all of us. So uh, what I can actually do is I can change the uh, time of day. Yeah, the time of the day, and it will also enable some fireworks. Uh, oh, that's cool. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh. oh. Wow. That's great. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, it would help if you could toggle the teleporting. Wow, that's wow. Are cool. Hmm. Huh. Woohoo! Been a great day. <laughs> yeah, been a pleasure. Hi. That's so great to hear. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah Mark, Mark. Mark helped make it. I would be a much choppier. He's a. He's an excellent tour guide. You, Mark. <laughs> I 
Hey, yeah, let's talk. Sweet. Yeah, thank you so much for a great tour. It was uh, it's a great environment. So, see you at the next one, hopefully. Sounds good. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Fantastic. Guys. Thank you. Yeah. Is he doing donuts in the boat? See you guys. Thanks, everyone.